one second. Okay, looks like I'm recording. Okay, go back to the screen share. There we are. All right, so let's get cracking. Uh, so first, uh, let's deal, of course, with a couple of uh, administrative things. Um, so as many of you may have been following or not, but there was a bit of a debate uh, that took place uh, these past several weeks, um, and specifically uh, whether or not our group should be private or public. We have now fully switched back to a private group, but I want to stress that the videos that we are doing and have done are not private. They are posted in a variety of sources, including my own personal public website, uh, and uh, the website that we're bringing out for MJM Legal later on today. Um, so uh, I just want to make you guys aware that anything that is said during these recordings are actually public, uh, whereas anything on the forum that we regularly interact with is, of course, private now, uh, thanks to everyone's um, overwhelming uh, voting on the subject. So let's get going. What we're actually dealing with today is property interests other than ownership. Um, and there are many actual types, many that you probably don't even think of, but I'm not going to deal with the minor stuff like profit of prandra, which is like the right to take apples from an apple farm. If you've already done, if you've done that your whole life or anything else, I, I could go into, you know, encroachment agreements and, and a whole bunch of other small areas. But what I'd actually like to concentrate on is the larger, um, concepts of, rights that exist outside of ownership. And to my mind, those really are commercial leases, easements, and restricted covenants. Now, for some reason, I cannot see myself. Um, let, me, let me just quickly figure out why it is that I cannot see myself uh, on this thing, which is making it, I guess it doesn't really matter if I see myself, but okay. Yeah, you disappeared. All right, oh, you can't see me either. Great, so I don't need to worry about how good my hair looks. Let's move on. So, um, going on in your head, what exactly have I done in life that this is how I choose to spend my weekday mornings? Me, I feel like this intro started off as at best an indirect put down of my efforts, but you're the person who writes these intros, touche. All right, let's get started. So let's start with commercial leases. <laughs> And it pays to ask, and I'm going to start conceptually, and then I'm going to kind of get into the weeds and start talking about the stuff that you encounter in real life out there. So what's a lease? Well, a lease is a grant in an interest in land by way of a contract, wherein the landlord agrees to allow the tenant to partake in quiet enjoyment of the space, and promises not to become involved in derogation from the grant. Now, the astute amongst you will note that I have made four things, or I have put four things in red in that statement. And as you can guess, those are the four things I am next going to discuss as we kind of conceptually understand what a lease is. Again, bear with me. In about 10 minutes, I'm going to get very detailed into like the terms of the lease, commercial leases that you see out there and everything else. But I really want to start just high level legal before I go into it. So what is a lease? So a lease is a grant in an interest of land. And what that means and it, it really, I mean, like I could go through the bullet points and you can see that, you know, it transfers use for a period of time for giving consideration, you know all that. What you critically need to understand conceptually from a legal perspective is that a lease is not just a contract that exists between party A and party B. It's party A and party B that currently own, or party A currently owns a plot of land. And what party A is doing is they're saying, I'm going to take my land and I'm going to carve out of my fee simple, which is my ownership, a leasehold interest. Why does it matter to explain it like that? Well, it matters because if you've done that, then upon the sale of that land, what you are able to sell is the fee simple with the leasehold interest carved out. And as a result, when you purchase land for someone, what you are purchasing is the contract that existed between two other parties entirely, the previous landlord and what will become your tenant. And that's why when you sign an agreement of purchase and sale with someone, what you are signing, and, and they say they can possession, 
what you're doing is you're saying, I want fee simple. I do not want any leasehold interest carved out of this. And it's not really necessarily up to the landlord to actually provide that because if they've already carved out a leasehold interest from the fee simple land, then they can't just get rid of it. Rather, what they have to alienate, what they have to sell is a fee simple with that leasehold interest intact. And that's why understanding the nature of leases that affect land is critical even if you aren't a signatory to the lease because you are going to be taking it on if you're purchasing land, you will become that new landlord because the right ascribes to what in Latin we call rem or in land. I, I know you guys conceptually always understood that in your, in, your, in your gut, but you should understand that that's the reason why we care about leases and land. Whereas other contracts don't necessarily affect us. Like we don't really care what you've signed vis-a-vis -a, -vis a car or anything else. You know, if, I, if someone else signs a new contract with us, we're, we're good. Maybe a car isn't the right, right option, but the privity of contract exists, and that's, I guess, the legal term I'm looking for. Privity of contract is a requirement for almost all things, except for the purposes of something where the contract itself has previously carved out an interest in an asset like land. So a lease is a grant in an interest in land, and it's done by way of a contract. Now, I'm going to stress that a contract, particularly for a lease, can be verbal, by conduct, or in written form. And while that may seem obvious to you, it actually, the people who get most confused by the fact that a lease can be conduct-driven or verbally agreed to are, in fact, real estate agents. And there's good reason for that. In 1666, and yes, uh, we're going to, we're still at the point of, of this talk where we're going historical. In 1666, England was replete with fraud. And the thing that most people owned above all else was usually land. And prior to 1666, there were a whole bunch of scam artists that would get people very drunk and then get them to commit to um, selling their land over a beer for nominal consideration, and suddenly people found them, peasants found themselves without land. And so the legislature passed what was called the Statute of Frauds. And the Statute of Frauds said that for people's biggest life decisions, specifically the sale of real estate, marriage, and divorce, all of that had to be in writing. Why did that matter? Well, it mattered because in 1666, most people were unable to read and write. And putting things in writing, even if you were drunk, meant that you would stop and say, let's bring this to someone who is learned. Let's bring this to someone who actually understands how to read. Those were usually priests or esquires, although esquires weren't necessarily around, but the educated class who could then read a contract and say, hold up you are giving away the farm here. And in that way, it significantly cut down on fraud. And in fact, that remains with us today. For the purposes of marriage, divorce, or the sale of land, contracts remain, it still has to be in writing. In fact, contracts are not valid unless in writing for the purposes of sale of land. But that is not true of leases, which is not the sale of land. It is not ownership. Remember, we're discussing property rights outside of ownership. And thus, like every other contract in the world, it can be conducted via verbal or through conduct. What do I mean by conduct? Well, I had a brother-in-law who spent many months in my basement. Um, my brother-in-law agreed to buy groceries once a month. Um, it could be argued that he had a lease. Hey, yeah. how are you? Uh, sorry. Sorry. One second, please. We have a little bit of background noise. Uh, uh, sorry. Can you... um, uh, sorry about that. They've changed. They've changed. There we go. They've actually changed the uh, zoom around a bit, so I'm learning the new controls. Um, so uh, if my brother had continued to agree to buy me um, 
my groceries, then we could have had a lease by conduct. He was living in my basement and he was going ahead and purchasing groceries once a month for us. Um, and that's valid consideration, absolutely. Uh, there are, however, permutations to the contract that absolutely need to be discussed. First of all, let's say that it was not my brother-in-law. There's actually a famous case. Um, sorry, uh, sharing is paused. Oh, I'm sorry. I was looking. Sorry, one second, guys. I apologize. Let me just shrink this because I was pulling up something else. So um, there's actually a famous case of someone in BC who uh, claimed that they were uh, engaged in a lease. And the court explored what that lease was. And they said, well, every month, at the first of the month, I, will ha I have sex with my landlord. Um, and as a result, uh, that is my payment. Um, and the court said, thank you very much. This was a time when prostitution was illegal in BC. And the court said, thank you very much, but that's not legal consideration. So the contract itself is invalid. Um, in fact, there were a whole range of times when the courts had to decide whether or not money for a lease, so valid consideration, um, was in effect when the purpose of the lease itself was illegal. And in fact, the courts have said, we will not uphold those either. So if you are, say, paying rent every month for an illegal gambling house, or if you're growing cocaine or something else, well, a court won't enforce that lease either because it's not for valid legal purpose. And of course, a contract has to have some very clearly defined terms. You can't just have a lease that says, I'm going on, if, if it's in writing, you can't say, you know, it starts in June as opposed to a specific day in June. And you can't say, I'll pay you thousands of dollars as opposed to $2,000. It needs to be very clear for the court to give it valid force and effect. Um, and I, I could go into more detail with regards to a contract. Um, the only other major detail that I'm going to go into for the purposes of contract formation, and we really did touch on a lot of this uh, when I dealt with contracts and contract law, for those of you who are part of it, is simply that the person who is contracting needs to have proper legal capacity. And I know what you guys are thinking when I say that, uh, you know, you have to be copus mentis, you have to be of age, you have to, and we, we've dealt with all of that in previous lectures. You can look up the contract law lecture and we went through it. But what I really wanna point out, particularly given that we're about to start talking about commercial leases in detail, is that most commercial leases are signed by corporations. And it strikes me that many agents don't actually understand what it is that they are responsible for when it comes time to time in a corporation. Because fundamentally, real estate agents are not taught how to investigate corporations. And by the way, that's not their job. So a corporation, if you're signing a lease in a corporate name, obviously it's only the corporation that's responsible. So if it's a newly formed corporation, you're basically getting nothing other than your deposits um, that you are going to be agreeing to. So you want to make those significant. Remember, we're in commercial leases, and as a result, there's no restriction on what you can take as a deposit. But the question of who has signing authority in a corporation is one that I just want to sit down and address for one second, because as you start signing commercial leases, you need to make sure that the person who is signing the lease has capacity to bind the corporation. From your perspective, most commercial leases are entered into between lawyers. That is to say, most real estate agents actually bind what are called agreements to lease, where they set out the fundamentals of what the lease contract will eventually contain and say, and within 30 days of acceptance of this agreement, the parties acting reasonably will draft up one of those 60 page lease agreements that you always see. And then you have the corporation sign. Now the right way to have a corporation sign, and with your permission, I'm just gonna change screens for a second. Just, I want everyone to actually understand how it is that a corporation, sh that you should be signing for a corporation. One second, please. I'm gonna, where's new share? There we go, there we are. Okay. So the right way you should be having people sign is you should have um, one, Ontario, whoops, Ontario Inc. Everyone can see my word screen, right? What I'm typing here. Can someone just confirm that? 
Yeah. Okay. So you're going to have that, and then you're going to have the signing line, and then you're going to write, oops, and then you're going to have per Mark Morris ASO, I have authority to bind the corporation. Now, why do we do it like this? We do it because as a real estate agent, you do not have the ability to verify the corporation, to do a corporate check, to check through the minute books or anything else. And so you are, a corporation is going to sign the document, a person is going to sign the document. So the best you can do beyond your deposits is actually bind and make the person who is signing liable for their signature. So when I sign a document like this saying per Mark Morris ASO, the first thing that you'll note is ASO. And ASO stands for authorized signing officer. In other words, I am stating that I am authorized to sign. And then for further measure, I'm writing beneath my line, I have authority to bind the corporation, meaning that I am authorized to engage in this agreement. Now, let's say a lawyer takes over the books. Let, let's say that instead of this, it's Microsoft Canada, Inc. Now, Mark Morris has never worked for Microsoft Canada, Inc. And you're a real estate agent and you're like, oh good, I've just bound Microsoft Canada, Inc. Well, let's say that you go to Microsoft and sue them. They'll say, well, we don't know who this Mark is. He just signed a random document. You will then be able to sue Mark Morris personally because I claim to be an authorized signing officer of Microsoft Canada and I stated that I was able to buy the corporation. And that's all you need to do. At that point, when it goes to a lawyer's office, it will, in fact, uh, revert to um, it will, in fact, revert to the lawyers to check on the corporation and verify that, in fact, the signatories are appropriate and that, in fact, they can bind the corporation. Okay. So that's all I'm going to say about capacity. Let's talk a bit more specifically about what a commercial lease is, the obligations, and then we're gonna to get to the clauses, which are the things you encounter on a daily basis. So I'm gonna kind of move away from high level, and I'm now gonna talk about, I'm still gonna talk mid-level before I get to nutty details. And I'm gonna simply say that in a normal commercial lease, by law, a landlord has obligations and the tenant has obligations. The landlord has the obligation to provide quiet enjoyment of the space. Quiet enjoyment does not mean that there's no noise. Quiet enjoyment means that there is what is expected um, for the area, what is normal. So you are not allowed to continually do construction in front of a store uh, if you own a strip mall such that people cannot get in there. That would be interfering with quiet enjoyment. Um, of course, they have to comply with the lease terms. And then they can't derogate from the grant. What does that mean? Well, there's a famous case um, where a farmer in Kentucky decided on a good business. So it turns out that Kentucky is really into horse racing. Well, probably should be obvious, Kentucky Derby and all that jazz. And a farmer owned a lot of land and he divided his lot of land into two parcels. And parcel B, he went ahead and uh, started marketing to all the Kentucky Derby winners um, that these horses who have won their owners a great deal of money, once they finish siring, because after they win, they sire, uh, and then once they finish siring, uh, what are you going to do with them except for the glue factory? Well, people, this guy realized, hey, a lot of people have affinity for these horses. Let's let them live out their life, and we'll give them a good life on this giant piece of land that we own, parts will be. Um, go ahead and he got a whole bunch of horses that lived out their life on this piece of land. Of course, he still had Parcel A, and he decided that he would rent out Parcel A to the U.S. military to conduct bombing exercises, um, which, as you can imagine, is an incredibly noisy and incredibly um, destructive uh, activity. Uh, sorry, I should mention that Parcel B was leased to someone who did that horse um, that horse uh, sanctuary. And the tenant that took possession of Parcel B sued the landlord for derogation from the grant. Their activities, the landlord's activities in leasing to the US bombing reserve or whatever they were called in Parcel A, uh, 
substantially meant that they were unable to in any way partake in the lease grant, which was trying to provide for a restful, quiet retirement for horses. Um, and as a result, we're able to get out of the lease. So the landlord has the obligation not to derogate from the lease. And the tenant has mutual obligations, pay rent, maintain the property, they can't commit waste, use the property legally and comply with the terms of the lease. All right, so that's very high level. I've spent 20 minutes doing that. Let's now delve into details because that's ultimately why you're here. So far, it's really just kind of been the OREA course. Let's talk about the commercial and the residential lease. Let's talk about the clauses that you experience and let's, 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 get, to, let's get to some, some nitty gritty. So first thing to note is that the difference between commercial and residential leases, in my mind, are that residential leases, it doesn't really matter what you sign, the province has stepped in and dictated what the terms of your lease actually will be. There's very little outside of determining what the initial amounts are and what the initial spaces are that's going to be leased that you can control. You could say whatever you want in a residential lease. You could say you owe me four months worth of security deposits. You could say you owe me, uh, you know, post-dated checks. You could say there are no pets. You could, you could say whatever you want. We are all aware that there are massive restrictions through the Residential Tenancies Act that override those contracts. And that is not the subject of today's discussion. Subject to today's discussion is commercial tenancies, where these rules don't apply. And as a result, really what you're governed by is the limits of your lawyer's competence or your real estate agent's competence. You are in the wild west in commercial tenancies. There is very little that the province of Ontario will correct through the Commercial Tenancies Act. It does not work like the Residential Tenancies Act. And both parties are treated as sophisticated, and whatever they agree to will largely override the CTA uh, and their contract will prevail, largely. And because of this, understanding the terms of commercial leases that are put in front of your clients are essential. And so let's talk about what those terms are and what the, or what the law that you need to understand vis-a-vis -vis the Commercial Tenancy Act is generally. So before I get to the terms, let's talk generally about commercial tenancies. Firstly, Unlike residential, that month-to-month -month clauses require 60 days notice, ending a tenancy in commercial is very different. If you're on a month-to-month -month lease, 30 days written notice is all that is required, true notice. And if you're on a fixed term lease, that is to say uh, it expires at the end of the year, you don't need to give notice. It's just, it's over at the end of that lease. That is all there is to it. it it's a simple contract. You have this for a given period, and a given period is what you have. <laughs> it doesn't go month to month. It doesn't extend into additional time periods, absent something in the contract. That's the way a commercial tenancy, a commercial lease works. And in the event that you don't pay rent, commercial leases are very different than residential leases insofar as the landlord has built in self-help remedies pursuant to the Commercial Tenancies Act, unless they agree otherwise. So 16 days after the non-payment of rent, a landlord can end your tenancy and lock you out. In fact, I've done this many times on behalf of landlords. Uh, now, the landlord says that they can lock you out, but that's actually not what happens. The person who locks you out is the bailiff. Does anyone want to guess why it is you use an actual person named the bailiff to lock out a commercial tenant? Anyone want to hazard a guess here? Throw something out there. No? Come on. All right, well, I'll tell you. The reason you don't want to lock out a tenant yourself, though you are allowed to do that, is because even though the person you're locking out runs a burger shack um, and literally just has a grill and a deep fryer, if you go ahead and change the locks, the very next day, they will turn to you and say, yeah, you changed the locks, but did you know that I actually had the Queen of England's jewels stored underneath the deep fryer? And those are missing. You stole from me. And this actually happened all the time. And as a result, landlords have smarted up and they now get an officer of the court, the bailiff, whose job it is to change locks and who can provide affidavit evidence to the court that the lock was there, they changed the lock, nothing was taken and they did it in accordance with the law and they provided um, 
they provided actual uh, proper uh, documentation on the window and everything else. And so landlords use these bailiffs. They don't cost a lot. They cost like 500 bucks or something when you call them out. And they are the people who change locks. And the landlord is allowed to do that or the landlord is allowed to seize goods and sell them after waiting five clear days. So after, if you have not paid your uh, rent, I think it's five days after you haven't paid rent, then you are allowed to seize the goods that are at the premise. And then after waiting five days, if they do not come up with the money for your rent, you are allowed to sell those goods after obtaining two independent appraisals. And in that way, you can recover your rent. So generally, if you have something like, I don't know, a cell phone store or something else, um, you can go ahead and seize those assets. Now, most landlords don't opt for that. And the reason they don't opt for that is because most people who are selling cell phones or most people who are selling items usually don't own those items. And you can only sell the items that are owned. And of course, the landlord has to go through personal property security searches and GSA searches and verify that fundamentally there's clear title to these items, which generally, if they can't pay rent, they probably don't have clear title anyway. So most people really opt for the non-payment of rent. But if you have people who have assets um, in the property or perhaps have um, trade fixtures or other things, and we'll talk about what those are shortly, um, then certainly seizing and selling goods is a good way of getting back your rent. And the landlord is allowed to do that by virtue of the Commercial Tenancies Act. And of course, rent increases, I bring this up simply because most people are used to the residential tenancies. The landlord can increase rent by any amount if the lease is at an end. So those are the features of the Commercial Tenancies Act. And that is, of course, um, the beginning. But what really happens when we start turning our attention to the lease is that we see a bunch of additional terms, all of which I now want to discuss with you here. Firstly, there's often, so if you have nothing in a lease, residentially or commercially, but particularly commercially is what we're talking about, then you are allowed to assign or sublet that lease. What is the difference between subletting and assigning? Well, the only difference at law, I, clear your head of what an assignment means because you, you are shaped largely by new build contracts that deviate from what the common law is. An assignment or a sublet is permitted at law for any contract that you sign, absent something that restricts you from doing it, which landlords regularly do as part of their commercial leases. Sometimes they'll allow subletting, but they won't allow assigning. And so understanding what the difference is is really critical. And the only difference between a sublet and an assignment is an assignment, in all instances, we're starting with party A. An assignment is someone who is done with the property entirely and says, I'm wiping my hands clean of this, I'm giving it to party B. Of course, they don't actually wipe their hands clean of it. If party B fails to live up to the terms of the assignment, then party A remains responsible, because after all, party A is the one who has the least contract with the landlord, unless the landlord agrees to release party A when they, uh, through a three-way agreement, which is pretty common in the builder world. But if all you're doing, if there's no restriction on your lease and you've agreed to assign to party B, that's a contract between you and party B, and you still have a contract with the landlord. And as a result, party A is liable if party B fails to live up to the assignment. But you'll note that the assignment is different than the sublet insofar as it is envisioned that party B will take it to the end of lease term. This is different than a sublet, where party A takes on a lease obligation with the landlord, Party B takes over it at a given point in time, and then party A comes back into the picture. So let's say it's a student, uh, let, let's say it's a commercial tenancy where you don't need um, property for the summer. Well, party A uses it until June, from June to September, subleases it to party B, and then come September, takes back the lease and starts using the property again. That is a sublet. Note that at all times, you do not need the landlord's consent for it, absent something in the contract itself that governs how sublets and assignments are to be had. And in the event that sublet from party A to party, uh, to party B takes place, party A remains liable to the landlord as they do with an assignment. In both instances, party A remains on the hook. Now, 
Now that we understand what the difference is between a sublet and an assignment, it's worthwhile noting that a sublet and an assignment generally in a proper lease are restricted. And generally, most commercial leases allow for sublets or assignments, and the landlord is permitted in its sole and absolute discretion, usually, depending on what parties negotiate, but just on balance generally, uh, to deny the sublet or the assignment in their sole and absolute discretion. Practically, sublets and assignments are almost never uh, denied if you can bring someone of quality to the landlord. Um, but the reason that the clause says that the landlord, assuming that the landlord was in control during the negotiation process and got this clause in there, the reason that the clause says that it will be at the sole and absolute discretion of the landlord is because the landlord just wants it run by them and they want to fundamentally control who it is that's using their property as you understand. So that's subletting and assigning. Does anyone have any questions on that before I move on? No, there's a lot, there's a lot of us here. There's about 10 people here, but I guess uh, a lot of people for, I guess, this particular topic. Um, but I guess if you guys don't have any other questions, I'm gonna keep on moving on. So we have quite a bit of ground to still cover. Another clause you're gonna see in commercial leases is that of continuous use and go dark provisions. Uh, and this actually stems from a famous case in Aventura, Florida. I don't know how many of you know Aventura, Florida. But there used to be a mall there, or there's a very large mall there uh, in Aventura. And um, the story behind that is really like the uh, Capulets and the Montagues from uh, Romeo and Juliet. Uh, two, part, two families owned two different malls on opposite sides of the street, and they hated one another. And they, like, throughout the years, they'd steal tenants from one another, and they were in a fight to the death. And so one day, one of the parties, the person who now owns the Aventura Mall, or eventually, or I don't know if they still own it, but they owned Aventura Mall, where Aventura Mall is now, um, basically came up with an idea. And what he did was he bought, and this was before the days of national chains, and he went ahead and he went to every single tenant that was in his competitor's store, and he bought up their lease. And he kept them operating. Um, but he bought up their lease. And when he had enough critical leases, he basically shut all the stores down. Um, and it cost him a good deal of money, but he shut down pretty much half of his competitors' malls, which was perfectly legal. Uh, and he continued to pay rent. And what did that do? Well, it meant that his mall, his competitors' mall, became a mall that no one wanted to visit. And um, the Aventura Mall was obviously the hot place, and he only needed to do that for a couple of months or a year before such time as the other mall was entirely ruined. And now, as part of normal leases, it is the case that a landlord insists generally that places be continually used and not go dark, which makes sense because it benefits everyone else in the mall when there is activity and beehives on activity as opposed to places that are shut down. Commercial leases also have guarantors or indemnifiers. Now I know this is bringing you back to OREA days and I'll just be very quick on this. The difference between a guarantor and an indemnifier is that an indemni a guarantor is only responsible for the extent of, your, uh, of, of the tenant's guarantee. So if in fact someone goes bankrupt, uh, their obligations to someone else ends. And as a result, when they come to the guarantor, they'll say, hey, guarantor, you have to live up to this contract and the guarantor or to what the other person pledged. And the guarantor will then say, well, I am living up to it and our obligations to you are nothing because we're bankrupt. This is different than an indemnifier, which says, hey, regardless of the reason as to why it is that these people aren't paying, um, we will make you whole, landlord we agree to make you whole. Therefore, always try to have an indemnity as opposed to a guarantee in a lease. And don't panic if you see a guarantor as opposed to an indemnifier in a lease, because sometimes the guarantor provisions of these leases are written to basically mean that they are indemnifying, and they say it very plainly. They say, you are guaranteeing this lease regardless of bankruptcy or yada, 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 yada. In which case, what they're talking about, they're calling it a guarantor, but it really is an indemnifier. All right, let's talk about a license versus a lease. So as some of you may be aware, um, I used to run a company called Access Law. 
And Access used to have arrangements. We used to have our law firm within Walmart and Loblaw stores. And I'm not revealing like very big secrets here. Anyone who deals with these large companies um, are always granted a license, not a lease. What's the difference? Well, a license, you remember I said that a lease carves out an interest in REM? And as a result, if you sell your property, um, then the acquirer of that property is effectively acquiring the lease terms because it's been carved out of the fee simple. That's not true of a license. A license is a personal right to use, but it doesn't carve it out of REM. And so what that means is that if Access Law had an agreement with Walmart to use a space and then Walmart sold their property to say Lowe's or Target, and Target turned to us and said, get out Access Law, they could in fact do that. Now, would we have suffered damages under the terms of the license? Sure. Could we have sued Walmart? Yes. But it wouldn't have kept our space. And as a result, by having it as a license, Target, when they are making an acquisition, doesn't need to do any of the due diligence necessary to explore the leases on the premise because they're licenses and they have no obligation whatsoever to the licensees in any event. I hope that makes sense. Any of you have any questions as I go, please ask or type and I'll ask. Mark, can you repeat that whole thing again, if you don't mind? Sure. So you'll recall that what I was talking about here in a lease is I said that a lease grants and carves a leasehold right out of a fee simple, right? And so what that means is that when you sell your fee simple, when you sell your land, the lease goes along with it. But a license doesn't, a license is just a contractual right as against another party to use a space. It doesn't carve it out of the land. So if I have a license to use and I sign that with party A, and then party A sells their land to party B, party B can turn to me and say, get off the land, please. And then I would say, but wait, I've, I, I have a lease on the land. It, it has been carved out of the fee simple. And a court would say, no, you do not. You have a license, not a lease. You have a right to use the land that has no basis in the land itself. And thus, you are allowed to sue party A because party A has sold land to party B there, and party B is now canceling. So it's a foreseeable damage. They have acted in a way that is violating the contract, but you cannot sue party B and claim a right in the land. And as a result, your damages at court are all you're going to get. You're going to have to get off the land once party B demands it. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So oftentimes, particularly when you're dealing with big players like Cadillac Fairview or Oxford and you are, you're, you're representing a small tenant, this is what I used to do through Slatewood, which was a previous business, um, oftentimes you're granted a license, not a lease. And you have to be able to explain to your clients what the difference are. Of course, with small players, landlords and tenants both like to have restrictive use clauses. Sometimes the tenants like to say, hey, I'm going to be the only shoe store in your a strip mall, and you agree that you will not take on another strip, uh, a shoe store. Sometimes landlords like to control what it is that someone's doing and saying, yeah, you could serve milkshakes, but under no circumstances are you to serve alcohol. And restrictive use clauses are part of leases that are very heavily negotiated and which is forms the substance of what it is you're getting by virtue of the lease and thus needs to be analyzed by both you and your lawyers very, very carefully. When you're dealing with large landlords, the restrictive use clauses are incredibly restrictive. I have seen things along the lines of, you cannot sell soda pop, but you can sell bouillon uh, soda, right? Like you can't sell Coke, but you can sell bouillon and Coca-Cola. I forget what it's called, that high-end cola. Um, that's how particular these things get. And they are subject to great negotiation. And your client will care very much about this. Another thing that I'm going to point out is trade fixtures. So all of you are familiar with chattels versus fixtures. Fixtures go with a premise. Chattels do not when you sell it. When you sell a property that contain trade fixtures, you are selling those trade fixtures as if they were, um, um, as, as if they are regular fixtures, meaning they go with the land. So what's a trade fixture? 
So if you have a barber shop and you have a sink, that's a trade fixture. Or, well, I mean, that's a pretty good example right there. And that, that goes with, uh, sorry, it goes with the land. It does not go with the land. I apologize. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to confuse. The trade fixtures are treated like chattels. So if someone goes ahead and installs a sink for a barber shop, then it is treated like a chattel, even though it is affixed to the property and it belongs to the tenant. The other thing you're going to see is the overhold rate. That's a regular thing that you will see often in commercial leases. And what's the overhold rate? Well, as we discussed, in the event under the Commercial Tenancies Act, when you have a fixed term lease, if in fact there is uh, the end of the lease comes up, and if you are still there, the landlord doesn't like that situation at all. And so generally what they say is, in the event that you overhold, we shall be entitled to charge you 200% of the rent or 150% of the rent. That's usually the two numbers that the landlord's office gave between. Um, and the whole purpose is to get you to sign a new lease. But if the landlord permits you to overhold and you do not sign a new lease, well, then you're going to effectively be paying double rent because the overholding rate of the lease will prevail, if that makes some sense. So those are the terms that you generally see in a lease, in a commercial lease. I would also tell you, and I haven't gone into this, but the way commercial leases run is that generally you pay a rent rate which is the amount that the landlord is going to take. And then on a triple net lease, the landlord is also able to pass on CAM, which speaks to the common area maintenance costs and usually some taxes. And effectively, when they are quoting what their costs are, they quote what their net costs are, how much the landlord is making, so say $30 a month. And then your obligation for a tenant is to understand what the true costs are, what the gross costs are, which include not only the landlord's component of profit, but also CAM, common area maintenance, and all of the extra costs associated that will be passed on in the form of electricity, in the form of maintenance, in the form of taxes, and everything else that the tenant is usually responsible for. And so you're going to spend a good deal of time negotiating that as well. So I have 15 minutes left and I wanna quickly talk about easements and then I wanna talk about restrictive covenants. Unless anyone has any questions about commercial tenancies. No, okay. So an easement is a right enjoyed by one tenement, which means parcel of land, over another parcel of land, which is usually granted for a special purpose. And so the types of easements that we always see are rights of way, mutual drives or statutory easements. And I, I'm just, this is high level conceptual. The easements take place and they are granted via express grant through prescription. Prescription is um, squatter's rights or uh, acquisitive prescription or uh, what's it called? Um, uh, well, anyways, prescription is, is, what, is what we call it. My, my mind's escaping me, but it's squatter's rights. And effectively, if someone uses an easement for 20 years and it's in the registry system, uh, then they can acquire rights in land. If you have interest in discovering prescription, we've done a talk on this in the past on the land registry. So please feel free to research that on our site or on my website um, by implication or by statute. And then you could terminate an easement because if both parcels of land are owned by the same party, if one, if the dominant tenement releases it, if it stops to have a purpose or if there's a court order, all of those reasons are reasons that uh, easement can cease to exist. But what an easement effectively is, is it gives one landowner a right over another piece of land. And rather than deal with the high level of easements, I really want to deal with how we encounter easements as real estate agents. And specifically, I'm going to turn my attention to Section 10 of the OREA Form 100. What this says is that provided the title to the property is good and free from other risk registered restrictions, charges, liens, and encumbrances, except as otherwise specifically provided this agreement, then you need to close. So in English, what it's saying is it's saying you have to close on this property unless there is A, B, C, or D 
that fundamentally has arisen at the property at the time of title search. So what are A, B, C, and D? A is any registered restriction or covenant that runs the land provided such are being complied with. So what does that mean? So a restrictive covenant, which is something we're going to talk about very shortly, is something that negatively affects what you can do with land. So a subdivision agreement, which says that all garage, all houses have to be of a certain height, or all garages need to be green, let's say. Um, if, in fact, there's a restrictive covenant on land and your garage is green, you cannot object because it's being complied with. But if the restrictive covenant says that no garages are allowed to be pink, let's say, and someone has painted the garage pink, I'm using an exaggerated thing that never really happens, but then at that point, you have a registered restriction on land. So your land is negatively, it's burdened because you're not allowed to just paint whatever the garage, whatever color you want. And what's more, you're not abiding by that agreement. And as a result, you can object to proceeding forward. So that's what A says. B says any registered municipal agreements and registered agreements with publicly regulated utilities provided they've been complied with. So that's, I'm, I'm gonna leave that out. That seems pretty obvious. If you have an agreement with hydro, um, then no problem, it doesn't cloud title. Then it says any minor easements for the supply of domestic utility or telephone services to the property. So if you think about it, every single property that you purchase in Ontario really has some form of easement that goes to it if it has electricity, right? I mean, fundamentally, there's something that's crossing your line. If there's something that is crossing your property in order to get to your house in the form of an electricity wire. And this is what we call a statute-based uh, easement, where the Ontario Hydro Act, or whatever the act is called, I don't know exactly what it's called, uh, basically says that despite the fact that everyone has individual property rights, any line that is run for hydro or anything else is in fact valid and it shall create an easement on your land, a right to run in the land. And you can't object to the fact that that is there, despite the fact that clean title has been promised. Because Section 10 of the OREA agreement says that these easements are fully protected and cannot be objected to. And then comes the critical one, D. Any easements for drainage, storm, or sewer, uh, sanity sewers, public utility lines, telephone lines, cable television lines, or other services which do not materially affect the use of the property. I'm currently dealing with a case in my office where someone has a utility line that disrupts their ability to go ahead and build a property. And there's a seminal case on this where someone discovered after they took ownership of land that in fact there was a giant sewage line in their backyard that precluded them from building a pool, which is what they wanted to do. do. Does that materially affect the use of the property? Sure as heck does. And so if you have a storm or sanitary sewer or anything else, no problem. You can't object just because that's on your land. But if you find out about that and it materially affects the use of the property, well at that point you sure as heck can object to those easements, even if they're registered on title, because they are materially affecting what it is you intend to do with the property going forward. And that's the way Section 10 of the Form 100 works. And that is how we deal with easements in its regular form. So if there is nothing mentioned in the title, that is to say, it doesn't say ST, an easement, subject to an easement, then we do not regularly need to worry too much as real estate agents as to whether or not there are any easements or not because a lawyer has been given section 10 of the form 100 which allows them to object should they discover that any particular easement is materially affecting the use of the property. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting to you you don't do your research and figure it out. I'm suggesting to you that if in fact a problem is discovered, this is the way lawyers deal with easements in the real world. Does that make sense before I move on to restrictive covenants? I'm going to take it from your stunning silence that the answer to that is yes. And I'm going to move on to restrictive covenants. Restrictive covenants are very interesting. So the way that Ed Sunshine and the way that Mitch Goldhar and the way that all these other big landowners have made money is fascinating. And I'm going to share it with you. So they come across a piece of undeveloped land like this. 
and it's owned by a farmer. And what they say to the farmer is, hey, here's $250,000 in a refundable deposit. I just want three months to do due diligence on this land. And upon tying up the land, they then go to the city and they say, hey, city, will you agree to divide up the land into this parcel, the one owned by, to be owned by Lowe's, and the one to be owned by these other small stores? And the city says, yes, we will allow for that. So Mitch Goldhar or whoever it is then goes ahead and says, all right. And they go to Lowe's during this conditional period where they have money tied up, but it is completely refundable. And they go to Lowe's and they say, hey, Lowe's, will you agree to build out a giant 230,000 square foot monstrosity over here on this parcel of land? If we commit to you that we will build out other stores surrounding you over here in the adjacent parcel. And Lowe's says, that sounds great. I really like having these small stores because it means that we're going to be a beehive of activity. But I don't want you to put Home Depot over here in these other stores. And so Mitch Goldhar says, don't worry about that. We will promise that we will register a restriction on this parcel of land that says no hardware stores over 10,000 square feet shall be permitted. And Lowe's with that assurance then says, yes, we're prepared to go forward. At that point, Mitch goes back to the undeveloped landowner and says, here's your $250,000. And Lowe's pays them a good deal of money for this land with the commitment to put a restrictive covenant on this parcel of land here. And they, Mitch then uses the land from Lowe's to build out these stores and pay off the land developer, and then basically gets rent from these stores with no mortgage because Lowe's has paid for it and Lowe's has gotten what they want, which is a giant shopping center which attracts traffic. And Mitch has ended up with free rent from all of these stores forevermore simply by taking someone else's land and subdividing for profit. Pretty good, but that's what restrictive covenants allow. So, I, I, I think that that's just interesting because if you're in the development game, you should understand how it's played out and what actually is happening and how people are using law. So that's it, guys. I'm going to leave the last five minutes for questions. And I'm going to point out that this lovely website line will be active as of tonight. We are activating my website after three months. I'm finally entering into the 1990s. I'm very, very, very excited about that. So come and join me on my website uh, by tonight. Uh, in the meantime, does anyone have any questions for me about anything I talked about? I know a lot of what we talked about today um, is a bit more technical um, and uh, in some degree a bit high level, but I can assure you if any of you deal with commercial tenancies, easements, or restrictive covenants, understanding these basics is really critical to making money and understanding how to address the problems that you will find actively in your field. So any questions for me? Oh, come on, I haven't gotten a single question the entire time. Surely someone has a single question. No, no. Anybody know what's the weather going to be like tonight? <laughs> I see it was that type of lecture. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right, guys. Look, thank you very much for everyone who came out. Uh, I hope you guys learned something. If you have any questions, of course, um, just continually hit me up. I'm always available. I wish you the best. The market is really on fire. We're taking in massive amounts of agreements at Clips. I'm sure you guys are doing a lot of agreements. Uh, so it is, as always, a massive pleasure, and I don't take your time lightly. Thank you. Thank you very much for everyone's time today, and I will post this on the website uh, by late this afternoon. Thank you, guys. Take care, and have a great day.